You know, after 11 parts of the series, you would expect there's nothing left to find. But I still come across stuff that just blows my mind and changes my workflow. So let's get right into it, with a tip that can save you quite a bit of time. Number one, you can edit many properties at once. You can change shared properties of multiple nodes simultaneously. Just select multiple nodes and edit the properties on all of them. It just works for everything. Change the color, set them to the same X position. It even works for stuff like materials or the script. If you work on a complex game, the next one might save your booty one day. Number two, there's support for custom editor tooltips. We all know a game project gets complicated really fast. There are so many parts and sometimes you forget what a node does and how it wants to be used. Luckily, editor descriptions give you a way to document nodes. You can just type it in the editor description property and it will show up whenever the node is hovered and if the tooltip doesn't appear, just reopen the scene and it should be there. It is really important to document your stuff. It prevents you from going insane in the long run. We also get a bunch of questions on how to structure your game's code. And here are two important tools for it. Number three, singletons and signals. Signals are a powerful tool to simplify communication between nodes. They are essentially an alternative to method calls. But instead of one instance calling another one, signals are connected and everyone connected gets a call. It's amazing because the one emitting the signal does not need to know who received it. But in order to connect them, you still need to know who connects to who. And it can sometimes be difficult to find the instances you even want to connect, especially when many instances want to listen to many other instances. Many-to-many -many communication can be done really easily with an event bus singleton. A singleton is an instance that is globally known and unique. You can add a singleton by adding the script to the autoloads in the project settings with the global variable flex set. The event bus is now globally accessible, so we can call a method and emit a signal from it. For this, the signal has to be defined in the event bus script. It's also easy to connect to it, but don't try to solve everything with an event bus. Sometimes directly connecting is just simpler. When you find yourself examining the signal and only acting on it when it is directed at you, there might be a better way. The next one could have saved me so much trouble if I had found it earlier. Number four, you can save color presets in the color picker. And it is amazing. You just hit that plus and there you have it saved. You can apply it with left click and delete it with right click. Before we were copy pasting the color values like animals. And it even works with colors brighter than one. When you work with tile maps, the next one is for you. Number five, you can copy paste auto tile bit masks. Auto tiles can be a bit tedious to make, but there are some tricks that can make your life easier. First of all, here's a template for the different modes. Without these templates, I would always forget some corner case. Now you import the tiles in Godot, add an auto tile to your tile set, and set the bit mask. You can now reuse the bit mask for all future auto tiles. Simply copy and paste the bit mask. If you don't use enums already, start using enums. And if you do, there are some tricks you might not know. So, number six, enums. You can define an enum with the enum keyword. Each of these pretty names is a shorthand for an integer. If you don't write anything, they count upwards from zero. And you can write which number they need to represent. And this is important for one of the nicest dirty tricks ever, bit stuffing. If you don't count zero, one, two, three, but instead one, two, four, eight, sixteen, you can put multiple flags into one variable. This is surprisingly convenient. You can use the bitwise and operator to find out which flags are set. Just use the variable and bitwise and it with an enum value. This way you can even check multiple conditions at once in a very readable and fast way. You can even define shorthands for common combinations, such as all of them. Apart from that, you can use enums like dictionaries. And while I usually give my enums names to describe what they are for, you can define enums without a name. Just don't name them. It's basically a short form of constants. This makes them a bit quicker to type out and a bit more compact. And now that you are primed with bit manipulations and other dark arts, you are ready for number seven, notifications. Notifications are callbacks from the engine. Some of them are exposed with functions like ready or process, but there are some others without functions. To use them, you can overwrite the notification method with an argument. The argument is defined by an enum. There's one for when the node is removed from the scene tree, it is reparented, it is about to be deleted. Wait, this is a big one. It's basically a destructor. Imagine you have an enemy that owns weapons and whenever the enemy is deleted for whatever reason, you need to make sure the weapons are as well. You can do this using this notification. The main upside compared to overriding Q3 is that this even works when a parent of the enemy node is deleted. 
If you are working on a more complex game, hauling your data becomes a challenge. And there are things that can help with that. Like number eight, databases for people who don't like databases. There are different ways to go about this. For larger amounts of data, we would always go for a spreadsheet. You can export to CSV, which is easy to parse. And it is just very clear and easy to work with. You can even color stuff. If you are afraid of parsers, you can use a tool like CastleDB, which exports to JSON. For a little less data, custom resources are a dream. They give you an option to keep it all inside the engine. You can define them in GDScript, simply inherit from resource. You can declare export vars, but also local variables and functions as you would expect. Give the script a class name and now you can just add a new resource of that type and fill in the export variables. We use this for our in-game stats as they have a description, flavor text, certain thresholds to judge whether they are considered high, etc. And you can define functions to make them really convenient. For example, to pretty print some of the data or to make checks. With the next one, we have some useful functionality from the almighty scene tree. Number nine, scene tree signals. There is the idle frame, for example, that is called immediately before the process is called. This is a nice way to wait a frame. There is also one for when the screen is resized, so your UI or game can react to that. And for the last one, more data holding with number 10, config files. Yeah, Godot supports config files. You can simply use set value on a file with a section, a key and a value. You can save it with save path. If you want to read it, use the load call and you can find all sections with get sections. When you iterate them, you can pull all values back out. If you want these files encrypted, just use save and load encrypted instead. If you want to have these files encrypted, just use save and load encrypted instead. It just takes an additional key. So let us know your tips and tricks so we can feature them in future videos. Also, if you want to help the channel, like this video and share it with your grandma.